good morning or good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, depending on the individual time zone you're joining us from today. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. With many companies still working with remote domain arrangements and dealing with difficulties in properly executing documents or handling filing uh, formalities, while being unable to hold physical meetings with business partners, shareholders, or authorities, finding digital solutions is of vital importance in times of COVID-19. So today we're going to focus on digital contracting and claims management in uh, the ASEAN region. And I'm very happy to have my valued colleagues, Markus Schlüter for Indonesia, uh, Michael Wekeza for Malaysia, Paul Weingarten for Singapore, Martin Krometzka for Thailand and Stefan Evers for Vietnam be on board as expert speakers. They will all give you an update on the current regulations in force in their respective countries. As to the schedule, uh, we will proceed country by country in alphabetical order with a Q&A session uh, after each country's slot. Please don't worry, should there be any questions left unanswered during the session, we will register all questions submitted and come back to these later on on a bilateral basis. Please do also note that we will record this webinar and have it made available online for you or your colleagues to recap anytime you wish. And of course, we will also be happy to share the slides with you afterwards upon request. So looking forward to a most informative session. It is now my pleasure to leave the stage to Markus Lüther. Yeah, thank you very much, Bettina, for the introduction. And also from my side, a warm welcome to everyone joining our session today. Yeah, as already uh, mentioned by Bettina, we still have a lot of um, COVID-19 lockdown situation in many of our countries. Uh, the ongoing increase of COVID-19 also in Indonesia since early March, uh, raises concerns for everyone in the country. It's affecting still numerous parts of business. Uh, up to now, it's still unclear to what extent uh, lockdown measures, uh, which are still followed by many companies, uh, will be eased in the next weeks, or whether maybe due to ongoing um, infections, uh, the the restrictions might uh, be obtained a bit longer. So yeah, many of our companies and clients that we discussed with in the last weeks uh, are still working remotely. They face their difficulties in executing documents or filing uh, them with the authorities. They're also unable to attend physical meetings, for example, with shareholders, uh, business partners, authorities. Uh, so it's a situation that uh, in Indonesia, like in many countries uh, in the world, currently impose uh, certain challenges for companies and entrepreneurs. So in the last weeks, we had several discussions whether and to what extent a digital approach or, uh, for example, electronic signatures in document issuance is permissible in Indonesia, which is something that in practice is uh, so far not uh, done very regularly. And um, although generally possible, many questions remain. So in this regard, I would like to outline some key aspects on using electronic signatures in Indonesia, particularly now during this pandemic situation. <clears throat> Um, there's a certain legal basis uh, for the use of electronic signatures, which is on the one hand, of course, the Indonesian Civil Code. It's a very old uh, civil law. The original name is uh, the Dutch uh, Burgerlijk Bet Book. Uh, it's from the early 20th century, so also more than 100 years old already, but it governs uh, general aspects of contract, which are also applicable to, to um, digital signing. Then more specifically, we have the law number 11 of 2008 uh, concerning electronic information and transaction. This law has been amended uh, uh, in 2016 to further adjust to international standards and uh, current needs um, that has been identified meanwhile. And uh, there's a government regulation number 71 of 2019, which is still quite new. Uh, this uh, contains further implementation rules for electronic
electronic transaction systems. Um, Bettina, can you give me the next slide, please? It can um, generally be said that documents uh, that are allowed for electronic signatures are on the one hand commercial agreements between corporate entities, uh, same as service agreements, um, which often are uh, done uh, uh, rather short-term basis, uh, lease agreements and other related documentations for residential or for example commercial real estate. Um, but there's also a number of documents uh, which is not permitted for electronic signatures. Uh, these include particularly corporate documents, for example, shareholders' resolutions that are required to be stated in a notarial deed form, or documents that are directly signed in a notarial deed form, uh, for example, a share acquisition deed could be named here. Then any kind of employment-related documents uh, or intellectual property rights, transfer documents, everything which is in this IP sector uh, is also a rather under a conservative approach still. Uh, real estate transfer contracts or generally any kind of documents or agreements uh, that have a statutory requirement, for example, of notarization or legalization, uh, sometimes in overseas countries. So it can be said that all those documents that uh, in any way will be submitted to officials still require an original signature instead uh, of an electronic one. Uh, Bettina, can you give me the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, in Indonesia, contracts are generally valid if uh, legally competent parties reach an agreement. This is comparable like in most jurisdictions in the world. Uh, Indonesia also knows the uh, concept of the freedom of contract. Contracts can be done verbally uh, or in a physical paper document or electronically, uh, provided that the basic requirements of a contract under the Indonesian civil codes are fulfilled. Again, comparable to many other jurisdictions, these basic requirements under the civil code include that there is a consent of the parties. Um, they both must have a legal capacity or competency to enter into such an agreement. There must be a specific subject of the contract to which the parties uh, agree. And of course, the contract needs to have a lawful cause, otherwise it would be void, like in most countries of the world. So um, parties of an agreement may conclude it through verbal or written contracts. And with the enactment of the electronic information and transaction law, a contract concluded uh, through electronic means would also be seen as valid in general. Based on this electronic information and transaction law, uh, generally electronic signatures are therefore recognized in Indonesia. But how is this concept exactly understood and used in practice? An electronic signature is defined in Indonesia as a signature containing electronic information attached, associated, or related to other electronic information which are used as verification and or certification tools. Okay, so far so good, but what does this uh, precisely mean uh, in practice now? For an electronic signature to have valid legal effect, um, the certain requirements should be fulfilled under the definition that I just mentioned. The production data, this means the personal code, the biometric code, or the cryptographic code, uh, or other code which is uh, created, depending on the information the technology. Um, these production data of the electronic signature must be associated only with the signatory. So no other person might in any way be associated with it. The creation of the data of the electronic signature need to show that it is only authorized by its signatory uh, at the time of the signing process. Any changes to the electronic signatures which are made after the signing have to be clearly traceable for the sake of respective transparency. And also any changes, changes uh, to any electronic information which is associated with such 
signature must be similarly uh, traceable. It must be possible that certain methods are used to identify uh, the signatories and uh, these certain methods uh, must be used to render evidence or can be used to render evidence that the signatory has provided his approval of the respective associated electronic information. So all uh, these requirements need to be fulfilled to have a valid electronic signature. Furthermore, a so-called electronic seal is also recognized uh, by the electronic information and transaction law as a non-individual electronic signature, which, for example, can represent a legal entity directly without any individual signing. There are two types of electronic signatures recognized in the implementing regulation uh, of 2019, which are certified as well as uncertified electronic signatures. Certified electronic signatures have a stronger legal effect regarding security and authenticity. They also have an increased evidential value in courts or in other legal proceedings. Um, to be considered as certified, such electronic signatures must meet the requirements of validity, which you just discussed, and they must uh, be issued by certified and registered Indonesian electronic certification providers who use uh, these certified developing tools. The certification and registration of these providers is governed and managed by the Indonesian Ministry of Communications and Informatics. Uh, which also guarantees the authenticity of the electronic signatures. Currently, I'm aware of uh, six certified and registered electronic certification providers in Indonesia. Their names are a bit odd to pronounce, but you can uh, see them all on the slides. Um, it's quite easy to access the websites of all these providers uh, or download the application and get further information on how to register and to purchase their certified electronic signature services. Examples of uncertified electronic signatures are, for example, a scanned written signature or digital consent in form of clicks or, for example, email signatures. Um, electronic signatures which are developed by foreign providers who are not registered in Indonesia are also considered as uncertified electronic signatures. So it should always be checked in advance if you make use of a foreign provider whether these provider also has a respective uh, registration with the Ministry of uh, uh, Information and Communication in Indonesia. For such an uncertified electronic signature, parties at a court proceedings would need to prove that the electronic signature arrangement can provide electronic records uh, that are suitable as evidence. So they should also satisfactorily support the existence, authenticity, and the valid acceptance of a signed document. Therefore, it's easier to prove the authenticity of a certified uh, electronic signature, of course. So how does the enforcement in Indonesia work? We are actually now in a situation where electronic signatures are technically regulated, but it seems that most courts and government institutions in Indonesia are still quite reluctant to uh, accept these and uh, tend to rather accept documents with original signatures. In practice, Indonesian courts and authorities are so rather slow still to accept uh, the new electronic means. Um, so contracts or documents that may be subject to a dispute uh, from your view should in practice ideally still obtain a manual signature. Given that electronic signatures in Indonesia do not really appear widely recognized yet, how can they help you during the current corona situation? Uh, from our view, there are some actions at least that might be considered at the moment. Electronic signatures can rather safely be used for executing documents uh, that are only being used internally in your company or corporate group for internal documentation, for example, and that are not going to submit it to courts or government institutions in Indonesia. 
as mentioned, uh, using electronic signatures from certified providers in Indonesia has generally better chance of acceptance. To be on the safer side here, it can help to discuss with the relevant notaries whether execution of certain documents with electronic signatures seems possible, for example, uh, for a statement letter or a power of attorney. We have seen that some Indonesian notaries are quite uh, flexible and fine with the use of electronic signatures on statement letters from companies during this COVID-19 situation. But up to now, uh, there's no real update from government authorities on the use of electronic signatures for submission or filing to the authorities. So unfortunately, the legal situation at the moment still remains rather blur. So in conclusion, uh, it can be said that electronic signatures are recognized under Indonesian law as legal, legally valid in certain types of contracts. Uh, for this, the valid validity requirements as stipulated in the electronic codes or the specific legislation uh, should be fulfilled. Um, and if the contract is governed by Indonesian law, we would recommend to use electronic signatures issued by Indonesian certified and registered providers to have stronger evidence, security and authenticity value to the extent possible. However, as just mentioned, authorities still accept these forms rather reluctantly or sometimes not at all, unfortunately. Consultation with notaries in charge can make sense, therefore, um, yeah. Anyway, we see a lot of legislative response to the corona crisis from the Indonesian uh, government and authorities at the moment, and these response might also affect the authorities' approach to digital signatures. So it is certainly helpful to regularly check for legal updates in this regard on an ongoing basis. Yeah, thanks. Uh, last slide from me, please, Bettina. That's it so far uh, from my side as a brief insight on uh, the current situation in Indonesia. As you see, um, there is still quite some potential for further development. Um, I think we have still a little time left. Uh, so if you have a question that you would like to pose, I have a look in the question and answer. Ah, here's one regarding dispute resolution. Can you give an idea to what extent the new concept of electronic court has already been implemented in Indonesia? Well, uh, so far, there's not much progress in practice. Um, as you might know, litigation in Indonesia is not really known for efficiency in terms of the time taken for such proceedings. The duration of uh, litigation is, in fact, quite unpredictable in practice. To tackle this, uh, the Indonesians have uh, the Indonesian government has introduced uh, electronic court concept last year. I think this is what you refer to. It is hoped uh, that this concept will help to reduce some issues related to current insufficiencies in the court proceedings. But um, to my knowledge, uh, up to now, physical attendance of the disputing parties is uh, still required um, for the court hearings. And I think this also applies to the submission of court documents. As far as I know, when this e-court system will be implemented in the future, written evidence that is submitted online will still need to be presented physically, at least in addition to prove its authenticity. So the concept of electronic signatures that we have discussed today remains still an issue in court proceedings. Um, if I recall correct, correctly, at least the examination of witnesses can be conducted through audio-visual communication means. So this might at least speed up the proceedings a bit. But so far, we have no practical experience yet. Uh, so it remains to be seen how this concept will be further enacted. OK, I will leave it with this question for the moment. As mentioned by Bettina, already um, all questions that you have will not be lost even if for the sake of time we can only choose a few uh, 
to discuss here uh, in the session, but uh, we will revert to you with all other questions that you have and uh, of course answer them individually subsequently to the session. So uh, that's it from my side. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to the Indonesian aspect. And now it's my pleasure to leave the digital floor to my colleague, Michael Wegeta in Kuala Lumpur. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much, Marcos, for, the, for kicking us off with the digital, uh, digital topics uh, uh, around the region here. So uh, also from me, a very, very warm welcome to everyone sitting somewhere in Europe or possibly here around the re region. Um, I was obviously particularly happy to see so many participants from, uh, uh, from, from Malaysia in our, uh, in our webinar uh, today. So again, a very warm welcome to everyone sitting in Kuala Lumpur, Penang today. Uh, and uh, who is willing to listen to our quick overview of uh, digital contracting and related uh, items uh, around uh, the region here in uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, let us kick off with the first slide on Malaysia. What we've got uh, is basically maybe a very short summary what we're going to look at uh, uh, today. Uh, so the first one is, uh, I, I thought maybe useful, sort of a similar manner as, as Marcus did, just to take one step back and uh, and sort of think for for a minute or two what we're actually talking about here. What is a contract and what are, what form requirements are sort of there and uh, why would we even think about writing contracts down and uh, digital signatures and uh, and uh, things like that. So that would be the first one. Then we will look at the two sort of uh, avenues uh, available for um, uh, for electronic or digital contracting here in Malaysia, one which is the uh, broad concept of a electronic signature and then the sub kind of concept of a digital signature uh, in a way not this, that dissimilar to uh, what is uh, in place in Indonesia and possibly we will find out later in, uh, in other countries and at the very end uh, we have a very brief uh, overview uh, about uh, debt recovery management uh, which currently is not very digital but uh, nevertheless this is uh, sort of these of these of the areas uh, we're going to look at um, uh, look at today in respect of uh, all items related to digital contracting in uh, in, in Malaysia so uh, first of all to kick us off uh, contracts would we'll be talking about here so uh, um, uh, in Malaysia, as you probably know or not, um, Malaysia is a common law country, so uh, uh, a lot of contract law is governed by, by common law, by, uh, by, by judgments. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is a Contracts Act, Contracts Act 1950, which uh, basically legislates certain, area, um, uh, certain areas of common law uh, which are relevant to, uh, to contract law. So the first question which we uh, need to ask ourselves here to sort of close in onto the subject uh, we're discussing today is what is a contract? Uh, and there is a uh, answer to this provided by the Contracts Act and the Contracts Act simply says uh, all um, contracts are all agreements which are enforceable in law. So then obviously it's, uh, we need to turn around and think one, when are agreements enforceable in law? Uh, again, uh, the answer provides the Contracts Act, which, Contracts Act, which then says uh, if these agreements are made by the free consent of the parties, which uh, who need to be competent to contract, i.e. not insane or otherwise uh, under duress, um, and, and so on, for a lawful consideration and a lawful object, and not expressly declared to be void. Uh, declared to be void could be, for example, a contract which is uh, designed or the intention of which is to, uh, to restrict competition or, or similar things. This is what we're talking about. What, are, what kind of form requirements uh, do we have? Generally speaking, uh, in, in Malaysia, almost all contracts can be made orally, uh, or, you know, by phone, by discussion, by uh, handshake uh, and, and, and so on. We have to obviously here distinguish uh, contracts from, from other things which may be related. So for example, there are obviously there's the concept of deeds, uh, but deeds are not the kind of contracts we're talking about today. So there are different requirements for, for deeds. So uh, in terms of signature and witnessing and, uh, and uh, to some extent still 
um, 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 still there is the, there may be requirement of, for companies to sign uh, to execute uh, a deed uh, under under seal. Uh, although in the new companies act, it is not uh, uh, not any more the norm. It is still possible. And then obviously we have all the areas of uh, of uh, uh, of um, uh, correspondence, uh, government forms, and correspondence with governments and uh, and, and forms and and uh, similar things. So, for example, there is a uh, uh, there are certain forms to uh, make a registration of a transfer of uh, of uh, property with the land registry. There will be a share transfer form to transfer uh, shares in a uh, in a company and and so on. So, all these things are not necessarily the things we're talking about today. We uh, predominantly will be talking about uh, about uh, contracts and the last maybe interesting uh, uh, item is that uh, um, um, uh, that uh, well they, they are very limited as i said most contracts can be made orally they very uh, there is a number very limited number of uh, of exceptions uh, which i mentioned in the slide and also it depends that uh, it depends on the on the malaysian state so there are for example there are malaysian states where uh, contracts to uh, sell property, real property, can be made orally in some states where this is not possible. So why bother with written contracts or digital contracts? Well, most contracts can actually be made orally. Uh, well, the answer is uh, uh, to provide court proof evidence of what was agreed. So that's that's the main reason why we would employ uh, consultants, lawyers, and uh, maybe IT consultants in the, in the context of digital signatures, um, in order to uh, to know what was agreed and who signed it and who agreed to uh, to what. So um, that's the main reason. And then it's worthwhile also in the context, especially of digital signatures, to think for one second: what is the purpose of a signature at the end of the document or a form? It's to confirm the identity of a person signing and also to confirm the willingness to be bound by the contents of the form of the agreement or some similar uh, documents. So in a way, if you if you approach the subject that way, th these will, will be the sort of things which uh, every electronic signature or the digital signature needs to um, needs to fulfill. So uh, if we move on to the next slide. We don't necessarily to have to go through every single item. You can have a look at it at your at your leisure about all the requirements. What I try to do here is basically just to uh, summarize the um, the requirements uh, of the electronic signature. So the electronic signature is something which uh, was introduced under the Electronic Commerce Act 2006, which effectively generates the uh, or sort of legislates for the entire area of. Uh, of electronic documents and, and signatures and, and so on. So in the next slide we will see later um, uh, there is there's a slide on the digital signature which is effectively a subset, a specialist kind of electronic signature with uh, uh, specific uh, specific requirements. So the electronic signature is the sort of the broad concept uh, uh, again uh, as regulated by the Electronic Commerce Act 2000 and uh, and six in the in the uh, in the context of all electronic uh, uh, documents uh, and similar things. So, what is an electronic signature? Uh, there is a definition in the Act, which is in a way not very satisfying because it doesn't tell us much. Uh, it's any letter, character, number, sound, or other symbol or combination thereof created in electronic form and adopted by a person as a signature. So it could be anything, uh, and we will see. Uh, further down, uh, obviously, we had uh, maybe not enough uh, court cases to actually look at that in detail what what it means, but we had some some cases. Uh, and uh, for example, there was one rather famous case which uh, dealt with uh, SMS messages with SMS uh, yeah with uh, messages sent uh, through the phone. So the question was, is it possible to uh, uh, to for a uh, SMS message uh, to qualify as a electronic signature, uh, and the court said yes uh, because the uh, SMS which was sent by someone was linked to a phone number, which in turn uh, allows uh, 
um, everyone involved and allowed everyone involved in the transaction to identify the person who sent it. And uh, in this particular ca case, the fact that a person, a specific person sent the message was not denied. So therefore, uh, a simple message sent from the phone was sufficient, declared sufficient to be an electronic signature. Um, what other examples do we have uh, in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of possible uh, signatures? So yes, we could think about a WhatsApp message because I suppose that sort of the reasoning will be similar to to an SMS. Uh, we could possibly have online banking if there is some um, uh, some requirement to to identify a person logging in the website or using some. Uh, some uh, some app um, that could also be the case for uh, all these uh, click buttons on websites saying I agree to you sending uh, uh, sending uh, uh, you know marketing material or I agree to uh, uh, to to the purchase of the following items on Lazada or, or similar. So uh, this this could all be the case. Uh, it could possibly also be a PDF image of a signature which is pasted on a on a Word document. Um, obviously, something designed around online banking will be stronger than a PDF uh, image uh, and, uh, and less likely to, uh, to be challenged. But I think the, the idea, general idea I want to sort of get across here that the uh, concept of an electronic signature is uh, considerably wide. So it's, uh, it could be a lot of things. So in a way, we need to be uh, equally uh, careful in terms of when we want to rely on one. Or equally, uh, and at the same time, to be careful about uh, situations where uh, maybe we just, you know, send a WhatsApp message or, or a short message or something like that. Uh, so I think the message here is to be to be mindful that this may also create uh, legal um, obligations. So uh, then uh, we don't have to go through all these requirements in, in detail. What are the requirements? Uh, uh, which which tests need to be uh, uh, which uh, a, a signature needs to pass to be a valid electronic signature under the uh, uh, under the um, electronic commerce act so uh, um, it, it kind of goes back to the, what we discussed in the in the last slide about what is the purpose of a signature so the electronic signature has to be somehow attached or logically associated with a document to which it relates document can mean again a whatsapp message for example, uh, then it has to identify the person signing and his or her approval of the information to which the, info, to the signature relates. Uh, again, uh, not a big surprise. And, um, and it has to be a sort of an element of reliability. So it, it must, have, must be reasonable for, for the party relying on the signature to be able to do so uh, reasonably. Um, so, uh, so these are these are the elements of of, uh, of the electronic signature. Uh, again, uh, what is reliability in this connection? Uh, basically, three aspects. Uh, uh, there has to be some element of uh, of the electronic signature not not so it it should not be possible sort of easily possible to change the signature post signing or change the document post signing. Obviously, that would defeat the purpose. Um, and the electronic signature uh, has to be somehow under the control of the person signing it. But yet again, uh, it could apply to, to many things. So it could be applied to the picture of depend, depending how it's sort of handled. Could be could apply to the PDF picture of, of a signature, which is pasted. Again, could apply to the WhatsApp message uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. So there are a couple of exemptions. So certain documents uh, which cannot be uh, uh, signed or executed using electronic signature. So this is all about power of attorney, for example, but that doesn't really matter since most powers of attorney have to be registered with the court in Malaysia anyway. Then the creation of wills, the creation of trusts, because usually a trust deed will be required here. So this is kind of out of the scope here and uh, uh, certain negotiable instrument, uh, instruments, so sort of a promise to uh, to pay you know, a certain amount of debt at a certain time and, uh, and so on. So this is the sort of very briefly the very broad area of electronic signature and we can jump to the digital one to the next slide. Um, so basically the, the, the digital signature is a more sort of a technical thing. It's basically it's uh, it's a uh, what well, a kind of software uh, which uh, uh, which uh, is used uh, 
by uh, by reference to a public key which is located somewhere on uh, on a server of the uh, uh, authority or company which issues the digital uh, signature so it's a kind of fingerprint uh, which is embedded into into documents so my example would be for example there is sort of uh, types of pdf documents uh, which accept the um, uh, a, a digital digital signature. So in this case, I would have my digital signature on a uh, uh, on a memory stick, and would uh, uh, insert the memory stick into my laptop, then open the PDF, and then uh, these two would somehow miraculously uh, merge as digital signature and the uh, PDF document. Uh, so uh, both are sort of linked together, cannot be change without the uh, um, about the change being uh, uh, detected afterwards and would create uh, an entity but again the sort of important difference between digital signature and electronic signature electronic signature is a piece of kind of software which uh, can be confirmed again against a database held by uh, the company which issued the digital signature in the in the first place. Um, interestingly, if you compare it to, uh, to Indonesia, as Marco said, uh, uh, currently there are four uh, companies which are listed here, but it can be you, you easily looked up, which issue these digital signatures and um, foreign uh, uh, companies or, or organizations which issue these uh, signatures uh, are not. Uh, if, so if a digital signature is issued by a, a foreign company, it is, cannot be a signature under the Digital Signature Act 1997 in Malaysia. So it's basically a foreign digital signature is pretty much useless currently in uh, in uh, in Malaysia. So the requirements, most of them we we discussed. It's sort of a a sig digital signature which is verified by reference to some database of an authority. Uh, it has to be affixed by the person signing with the intention to sign the message, which goes back to our uh, uh, our uh, first slide on the on the contracts and uh, effectively the last one is uh, that the uh, recipient uh, has no knowledge about uh, you know, the signature being invalid or otherwise out of the immediate control of the person uh, using it um, so uh, what is the reliability aspect here it is verified against this database of the licensed uh, of the certification authority or the company and uh, you have also a an element of validity because these digital signatures have to be renewed uh, uh, now and uh, then generally they should be as uh, as valid as uh, as signatures which are placed on paper um, and uh, however there is sort of much discussion which i initially sort of mentioned about uh, generally speaking there should be as according to the digital signature act should be as good as uh, Assigning for a company, for example, assigning documents uh, under seal, so a digital signature should be enough. However, currently uh, there is uh, there is no means of signing assigning share uh, transfer forms or property transfer forms by using a digital uh, signature, and it's also not advisable because it will simply uh, slow down the uh, the process. So that's this sort of subset digital signature. If we move on to the next slide. Uh, some things to remember, just a couple of things which are sort of summarized on the, uh, at, the, at the end, especially in the concept of the uh, of a electronic signature. Uh, think about the uh, what using is it intentionally, uh, i.e., wanting to rely on it, but also using it unintentionally by sending the odd, odd, odd WhatsApp message and possibly creating some. Uh, uh, some legal uh, uh, claims or requirements or contracts or, or similar. Um, uh, obviously, if, if you want to use it for important contracts, uh, you have to prepare it well in advance. Uh, uh, ideally, use this digital signature because it's more reliable than the uh, electronic signature. Um, and uh, yeah, prepare it correctly in terms of get the signature and get the certification and, and so on. And uh, be aware of the usage uh, conditions and when it can be used and when it cannot be used and uh, things like that. Generally speaking, uh, I would say uh, how 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 often uh, are these things used? Uh, I think electronic signatures are used uh, a million times every day. 
for e-commerce purposes for for other other things digital signatures i don't think are very popular and uh, not widely used currently in, in in malaysia and generally speaking from experience all these areas which are sort of a bit tricky in terms of uh, you know powers of attorney shared transfer forms uh, Documents requiring seal. Uh, I mean, generally, uh, all these digital, all these digital things are not used in this in this area because uh, simply there is a level of uncertainty, uh, which can be avoided by um, by using paper forms, which may may change, uh, uh, may change uh, due to the COVID uh, situation. And generally, government agencies, same as uh, Indonesia, are not very. Uh, keen on all of this, I would say, and slowing it down. So generally speaking, the, uh, the Malaysian sort of system is to create an account which can be accessed by an individual, uh, for example, with SSM, which is the Companies Commission of Malaysia, which then effectively the signing in into this account identifies the user rather than a digital signature uh, or some software which is verified against uh, some database. Okay, next one. Uh, okay, that's just very briefly, so uh, I uh, uh, try to do it in, in two minutes. Uh, age debt management, debt recovery, it's not currently not very digital uh, in, in Malaysia, so we two, uh, two things which we can talk about here, think about here. One is age debt management, which is the internal process to recover uh, age debt. Uh, tracking of debts, reminder letters, or selling of claims to debt recovery companies, and then the legal kind of process of debt recovery through lawyers and courts. So the first step here would be to get a, a solicitor, a bar council member here in Malaysia to issue a letter of demand uh, to uh, the person you want to recover uh, your money from, detailing what happened and why you want the money. Uh, um, this is not mandatory but recommended because sort of it gives notice in advance of, uh, of court proceedings should these become necessary. There's no minimum amount of recovery so every uh, any account can be amount can be recovered then it just depends to what court it goes uh, and maybe two things to remember uh, three things to remember the limitation period is six years to commence proceedings and you have then 12 years to execute the the judgment uh, afterwards if you get it if there is an insolvency situation that's obviously different then there's the proof of death has to be filed with uh, the insolvency department and then the last slide uh, these are just the ways of, uh, of enforcing a judgment. Uh, so uh, a winding up petition or bankruptcy petition is very popular with company because uh, it uh, gets rid of the company, closes down the company effectively if they are not willing to pay the debt. Uh, you have um, uh, you have the um, uh, di different uh, other ways of we don't need to go into great detail here uh, what what it is we've got charging orders to recover from third parties um, sorry that's the Ganeshi proceedings to recover from third parties uh, you can uh, you know uh, at, uh, have a charging order and uh, enforce into uh, into shares and stocks and similar uh, things or just send the bailiff off to recover the property of the of the uh, of the um, person owing you the money depending what is uh, uh, what is there so uh, that's me done uh, yeah, thanks uh, for this insight, Michael. Um, yeah, that was a very good glance in how the situation is in Malaysia. Thanks a lot for this. We have a minute left uh, to have a little Q&A. I saw that some questions were coming in. Uh, this one here might be quite interesting for uh, different industry sectors. Um, in what industries are electronic signatures commonly and successfully used? And in which areas of legal business dealings are electronic signatures not yet recommended? Maybe you can give a very quick yeah. uh, idea in this one. Already uh, sort of kind of almost mentioned it. So if, if you look at all these uh, e-commerce things, uh, I mean, this is just full of electronic signatures where someone orders something and confirms something by uh, by somebody writing your name or, or clicking on some some button confirming something. So I think all this e everything related to you know e-commerce, including banking, uh, electronic banking, and uh, all these other things. I mean, this happens you know hundred thousands of times uh, every uh, ev every day. So I think this is sort of the prime area where 
uh, things, uh, electronic signatures are being used. Uh, I think what is least uh, sort of uh, um, what probably currently at least is not not a good idea to to use electronic signatures or digital signatures is probably. Um, it's the area which I mentioned about uh, submission. Obviously, there are certain areas where it cannot be used, like, you know, for uh, powers of attorney or sort of things like that. And uh, mm -hmm. I think similar to Indonesia, everything related to uh, uh, a lot of things related to, um, uh, to authorities, whether it is a shared transfer form which needs to be stamped or, or is... Um, land registry or, or some some other things so usually how uh, how authorities work uh, here is through these uh, uh, through these uh, uh, kind of accounts uh, where for example if you're a company secretary you know you log in and then while logged in you submit certain documents and this is your identification the same things if you correspond with the tax authority then you have a account as a tax agent and then you log in into this and then you submit through your tax agent account uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So you could possibly say this is sort of an electronic signature in itself, um, but uh, I think generally submitting kind of documents which are with attached digital or electronic signatures, this is probably not uh, not very common uh, beyond just scanned PDFs of, of paper documents, obviously. Okay, thanks. And uh, with regard to digital signatures, um, who actually bears the risk of a forced digital signature? Yeah, interesting one. Uh, obviously, yes, you could say that the code could be all this, is, I don't know, hacked software and hacked digital signatures or stolen ones uh, and, and so on. In particular, if, in particular if, if this digital signature is possibly on a memory stick or somewhere like that. Um, and the answer is uh, in the act itself, in the Digital Signature Act, which simply says that uh, it's the uh, it's the recipient. So if I'm uh, if, if you're signing with a digital signature, you're sending it to me, uh, then I've got I, I'm I'm the one who has to bear the risk uh, um, uh, if if the signature is forged. And the Digital Signature Act uh, also gives the recipient of the signature is or the recipient is under the duty to. Uh, to notify the signatory if he or she wants to reject it on these grounds. So this can be done. Right. But, well. um, yeah. So the, the burden is on the recipient. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we leave it uh, to this. There are some more questions, but due to the uh, time that we want to observe, of course, um, I will now move forward to your neighboring country, uh, also a common law jurisdiction. And it's my pleasure now to leave the digital floor to Paul Weingarten in Singapore. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcos, and good afternoon or good morning from Singapore. Well, after two months in a sort of lockdown situation, the so called circuit breaker will end next week, and Singapore will um, begin a reopening in three phases. Uh, during the first phase, however, which will probably be the whole month of June, many or most people will still work from home. Most shops will still be closed and most uh, restaurants will also remain closed for dine-in. So the disruption arising from COVID-19 may easily result in a situation where obtaining a so-called wet ink signature is just a, a hassle or even impossible. So we will now look into how your organization can implement, if you have not already, um, electronic signatures, electronic records, and where there are possible limitations to it. In the second uh, part, we will briefly, very briefly, touch upon claim management. It's basically how do you deal with non-performance, either your own non-performance or the non-performance of a contractual party in this particular COVID-19 situation. So coming to electronic signatures, I think uh, we've heard a lot, and I have to say that uh, probably quite a bit that you've heard from Malaysia would in a way um, apply also to Singapore, but Singapore was really the first country to pass uh, a specific law concerning uh, electronic contracting in 1998. Uh, and the first one to implement the EU convention, UN convention on the use of electronic communication in international contracts, which was done by the amendment to the set act in 2010. 
Singapore is a quite modern society and we have e-filing for authorities, we have a core pass, it's like an electronic ID for each company where we can log on to all the different uh, ministries and, and to filings as well. So um, in general, um, I think e-signature is something that is really not so uncommon in, in this part of the world. Bettina, yeah, okay, it's already here. Um, that brings us to the um, legal basis. I think I will cut this short. As I said, uh, you have heard a lot already. So Singapore has this Electronic Transactions Act, which basically says any electronic signature is equally recognized to a wet ink signature. Of course, the definition, as you see, reads a bit more lengthy and also opens, of course, some room for interpretation and probably to be challenged whether the method that was chosen is reliable and appropriate for the purpose of the specific uh, electronic transaction. But in general, the courts would also interpret this quite wide and would normally very generously accept electronic signatures and electronic contracts and electronic records. Like you've heard from Malaysia, um, certain matters are excluded. I think it's more or less the same catalog uh, also for Singapore. And I think um, um, we should be very careful with deeds. It is not recommended to do deeds in, a, in an electronic form. Electronic records are in general also recognized. So if you normally would keep an original copy of a document and now due to COVID-19, you cannot, um, it would most likely be sufficient to just keep a soft copy. As electronic records are vastly recognized, first of all, by the Electronic Transactions Act, but also by other laws like the Companies Act. We see it in HR, we have electronic personal files, we see it in accounting, where we don't, need necess don't necessarily need the physical accounting vouchers, and uh, even corporate records are uh, often kept uh, electronically to a certain extent. Right? That brings me to the next slide, and we would like to come back to our example. Um, that you need to sign a contract that you would probably normally have signed um, in wet ink, but now due to the COVID situation, you can simply not obtain wet ink signatures. So the, the first basis would be this Electronic Transactions Act. You are generally um, fine to sign electronically. But then of course, the other laws or other other rules may apply. And I think Michael has already touched upon the general principles of contract law, of uh, acceptance, intention to create a binding contract, consideration. So all this, of course, also applies by signing electronically. And um, you should probably not forget that some specific laws or some specific contractual provisions may um, not allow for an electronic signature. So we said the Companies Act, for example, generally allows electronic records, but the constitution of the company may, for example, require certain format or certain form to notify shareholder or to hold meetings physically and so on. So these are limitations. Also in your framework agreements, terms of conditions, or even in the contract that you try to amend or get signed, there could be a provision that any amendments are in writing most, in most cases, in writing would mean electronic signature and it would be fine. But if it is specified that it does exclude electronic communication and electronic signatures, then of course there are limitations. Whether a contract can be signed in counterparts or whether all the electronic signatures have to be placed on the same document. So all this needs to be considered when you probably change your routine and don't sign as you normally do, but now want to sign electronically. And of course, um, you have to take into account the, we call it electronic risk. So electronic records may easier be forged or modified than um, just the original uh, paper documents. The main issue is here actually, is the electronic signature genu genuine? Is it applied by the person it claims to be associated with? And was the person who applied it authorized to apply it? Right? So, for example, um, your assistant, your PA, uh, could maybe easily place your electronic signature on a document, you're traveling, maybe not now during COVID, but, um, and you just say, oh, please use my electronic signature and place it. Your assistant will probably not just sign uh, with, your, with your wet ink signatures. You would then probably um, make it clear that she's signing on your behalf. So, 
This is actually the key thing. It is a bit more difficult to establish whether an electronic signature is genuine and it is a bit more exposed to, of course, being uh, modified or forged um, the electronic records as to the um, um, paper records. Um, electronic records are, of course, quite useful now. You have stored your document on a server in the cloud, you can access it. Um, of course, there is a potential risk also that documents get lost or that you have a bit more difficulty to control the access. You may believe that this is safe and that the access is restricted, but due to some technical um, incidents, um, it can happen that documents get lost or are accessed by unauthorized persons. So all this uh, is the so-called electronic risk. And um, if you go to the next slide, we will see what you can do to actually mitigate this risk or how you can handle it. I think um, it is probably a, a very good idea to have a, a risk profile established. You should um, maybe categorize transactions and take a certain risk assessment to each category. So for example, let's start with your contractual party. You could have a trusted versus a non-trusted party. For example, if now during COVID times, you would like your employees to sign a document which is prepared by your own organization. And since you can't circulate it or send it around in a physical way, you decide to go for e-signature. The risk is certainly much, much lower than if you deal for the first time with a third party that you don't know, that you have no dealings with, and you would accept an electronic signature right away. Um, also, of course, the volume of the transaction could be an indication whether or not you are comfortable using electronic signature. Again, it is recognized, it is a valid signature, but it can maybe be easier challenged in case you have a dispute, which brings me to the next point. This is also a fact to consider. If you already foresee that there could be some disputes, whether or not a person has properly executed a contract, whether he wanted to be bound by the contract and so on, then you better opt for the wet ink signature. You should, of course, implement strict KYC policies. I mean, this is nothing that has to do with electronic signatures in the first uh, place, but also during COVID times, uh, you should really keep to your strict KYC policies. So if you have a new customer, a new third party you deal with, and you even agree to deal with this new customer on a merely electronic way, you should really put an emphasis on your KYC due diligence. Um, you can do a video conferencing, uh, see the passport. There's a few ways to verify. Um, some commissioners of OATS, for example, in Singapore can also verify um, identities via video conferencing. So you can even involve third parties to help you to, to identify um, your customers. You have a list of like approved suppliers and approved um, customers or vendors. You can also ask um, your uh, business partners to create an account uh, for an authorized person. So you know exactly who is authorized to place in electronic signatures and uh, who is authorized to deal with you in a certain way. So all this I know applies to the uh, ordinary course of business in also wet ink contracts, but I think it even more so applies to the electronic signature. Also consider um, the validity of the electronic signature. We have heard in Singapore, more or less no issue, but as we have just heard before, um, in other countries, not every document is recognized to be signed in an electronic way. So where is your contractual party located? Where would the document need to be enforced? Does play a role in your risk assessment. And then you can have additional measures in place just to feel more comfortable. Um, for example, you can have a, a wet ink framework agreement to then authorize to have certain uh, authentication um, me mechanisms in place, such as a um, password or a user account. Um, you could, uh, of course, also um, ask a counterpart who sent you a document that is signed electronically to confirm in the email, yes, I have signed this document with my electronic signature, please see attached. Um, so all this is just an additional layer of uh, proof that the um, electronic signature is uh, genuine and uh, equally uh, trustworthy and accepted than a wet ink signature. Within your company, you should implement a e-signature policy. So you should probably make it clear what kind of documents can be signed electronically and what kind of documents cannot be signed electronically. 
and whether your employees should use a certain service provider. I think we have heard about the different types of electronic signatures also, or even digital signatures. But even for electronic signatures, providers like DocuSign and so on, these platforms, they um, could provide an additional layer of security because they impl imply like a, a track and trace mechanism where they can see who logged on, who signed which document at what time. So in practice, to summarize, I would say, Electronic signature is more and more common in Singapore, and it is also part of the government's aim to make Singapore a digital society. So also courts and authorities would normally largely embrace e-signature to the extent possible and permitted. That brings me to the last slide, which is on claims management. Um, again, um, COVID-19 causes a lot of disruption. You may find yourself in a situation where you are unable to fulfill a contractual obligation or one of your suppliers, contractors, is unable to fulfill his obligation. Singapore has enacted uh, the so-called COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act, which grants relief from legal action for a period of six months from the 20th of April to the 19th of October 2020. That is the current uh, situation. And this relief can be in different aspects, depending on the different um, industries or types of contracts that are covered. Basically, um, it applies to cases where a business can not fulfill its obligations due to COVID in the following areas of contracts, commercial and property leases. So only commercial, not private leases. The landlord would not be able to terminate the lease or evict you from your premises. In the construction and uh, supply contracts industry or for supply contracts in general, you would, under certain circumstances, not be liable for a breach of contract due to non-performance. And your customer could not uh, call on performance bonds and your customer could also not start insolvency proceedings. Um, in tourism and event-related uh, uh, contracts, the um, organizer would not be able to forfeit automatically the deposit, for example. Um, higher purchase agreements for planted machinery, the seller cannot reprocess planted machinery. But of course, all this is only for the period it is stated, so it is a temporary relief. But you need to consider this, of course, in your claims management proceedings. And if you can't get relief under the Act, you have, of course, to look into your contract. I mean, know your contract is key in any ways, and you need to see whether you have any contractual clauses that could apply, force majeure, frustration, um, termination clauses, customer delay, change of order. So it is very crucial that you really know your contractual rights and then you need to decide how do you com communicate. You need to manage the notices you send or your employees send. You need to observe <clears throat> deadlines, of course. You may be um, obliged to or you may be in the position to request a mitigation plan from your supplier who cannot perform. So Singapore in general uh, encourages the parties to talk and to settle disputes under the COVID Act, for those contracts that are covered under the COVID-19 Act, um, if the parties cannot find an agreement, either party can always apply for an assessor from the Ministry of Law who would then make a determination which is final and cannot be appealed for. So, for example, that could be to postpone a contractual uh, obligation or a delivery deadline. Singapore is, of course, a uh, dispute resolution hub for the entire region. And I think I will, with respect to the time, um, only very, very briefly um, mention here that uh, the Singapore International Mediation Centre has launched a, a specific COVID-19 protocol and that uh, Singapore has uh, adopted the uh, Singapore Convention of Mediation, which was adopted on the 20th uh, December 2018, and it will come into force uh, this September 12, 2020. Currently, um, it's only Qatar and Fiji, apart from Singapore, who have signed it. But of course, the idea is that it's an international agreement on the recognition of mediation settlements. And um, I mentioned the arbitration hub, of course, um, Singapore's arbitration center, SIAC, is uh, very well known in the region. Singapore is a member of the New York Convention, of course. And even for 
court litigations, for ordinary court litigations, you may have noticed or may have known that uh, Singapore joined uh, the Hague Convention on the Choice of Court Agreements, which is also endorsed by the EU. So um, it is potentially easier uh, now to enforce even court decisions in certain countries, uh, in particular, for example, Singapore and EU. So that's it also here. Um, contract and claims management uh, can be particularly important, I think, during these uh, COVID terms. And uh, the emphasis here is certainly um, how you communicate and how well you know your own contract. So that brings me to the end of this very brief introduction. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Paul, uh, for this uh, nice ride through the Singaporean aspect uh, of this uh, electronic signature and contracting situation. I see that quite some questions come in uh, and uh, selected some which might be interested, interesting for the majority of our participants today. Um, but uh, if possible, let's keep the response as short as possible due to the time. But uh, this one uh, might be quite nice. We are a startup company facing the next round of investors coming in. You mentioned that Singapore allows electronic records. So would it be possible to issue electronic share certificates to a new shareholder? Oh, um, you said it should be short. This is actually quite a, I think, a, <laughs> a complex uh, question. <laughs> Because there's a, a number of aspects to it. I mean, maybe maybe a share certificate, first of all, is uh, a prima facie evidence of uh, the title to a share. And uh, indeed, most common is to have a physical uh, share certificate issued, even with a seal. And uh, this is also what many constitutions and the standard constitutions of a private limited company would foresee that <clears throat> it is signed by two persons and the common seal is affixed. Um, the new amendments to the Companies Act, however, allows that uh, instead of a common seal, if two persons, two directors or a director and a secretary sign, then this should be recognized as well. So then you could argue like no seal requirement, just signature, and then you go back to the probably ETA, Electronic Transactions Act, which says if there's a requirement for a legal signature, then this requirement is fulfilled if the signature is placed electronically. So I think, yes, in uh, theory, it would be possible. I have not seen it much, I have to say. Uh, I've right. actually not out of it. In practice, uh, considering the risk, um, I think you would still prefer to have physical share certificates issued. Um, this is also, I would say, more or less common standard, but there are new company secretary firms out there who do a lot of online documents, so I would not rule it out that it already exists. Yeah. Okay, here's a rather short one, I think. We have a supplier who sends us an automatic purchase order confirmation. Is this valid? Oh, yeah. Um, it is, it is. I mean, uh, the uh, ETA has... Uh, Expressively, the Electronic Transactions Act says expressively that offer and acceptance may be done electronically. And it also says that if you use any uh, system that generates uh, any um, uh, automated uh, response for you, then this is deemed to be originated from you. So I think we can probably just think of the example in an analog world. You have a sales manager and your sales manager signs a contract. Because you put the sales manager in place, um, you can later not say that you're not bound by this in general, right? So same rational, I think, uh, would apply here. If you set up a system in your control that automatically accepts uh, offers or purchase orders, then this is the way you have chosen to communicate, and it uh, is a valid uh, contract per se. Okay. Good. Um, we keep it for this. All other questions uh, coming in will, of course, not be ignored, but uh, due to the time, we will then uh, react to them on a bilateral basis later on. So thank you very much, Paul, for this uh, nice insight in Singapore. And now we move on to the Kingdom of Thailand. And I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Martin Kometzka in Bangkok. Hi, Martin. Hello, Markus. Thank you very much. And a uh, warm welcome from uh, Bangkok for digital contracting and claims management in Thailand. 
Um, like my colleagues, I will also divide it a little bit into a digital contracting on the one hand and um, and uh, claims management on the other. Uh, let's start here with digital contracting. Uh, Bettina, if you could give me my first slide. I'm not sure if you can see it already or not. Um, I, I'm just going to start, and I guess we're going to get there. Maybe it's maybe it's my technology that's not working too well. Um, so uh, digital contracting, yes. So uh, oh, actually, overall, Thailand has quite early on uh, adopted means to facilitate digital contracting, basically since the early 2000s, more or less in line with the back then dot com dot com area and bubble. Um, however, we have to say in practice, many businesses and government entities are still relying heavily on, on real good or tangible paper. Um, and um, it has not really taken off in Thailand so far. Actually, the picture is a little bit twofold. We see some new businesses, startups or mass consumer products that are relying heavily on, on digital means. And we see more traditional businesses that are more like reluctant to adopt these new measures. But we have to say, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis, we are seeing um, we are seeing some movement towards electronic uh, electronic means to facilitate social distancing and so forth. However, uh, we we think it comes a little bit from the from the public sector, such as submission of documents to government authorities, and facilitating electronic meetings of shareholders. So I'm going to say a few words on this one as well. Um, but let's start with uh, with the digital contracting, even though it's not very prevalent in Thailand right now. Um, so in general, the contract formation is uh, still governed under the general principle, similar as my colleagues have uh, mentioned for, for their respective countries. Um, however, the information exchange is governed specifically under the uh, Electronic Transaction Act, or ETA for short, um, which was actually updated last in April 2019. So the main purpose of this act is, and was and is actually, to ensure the legal validity of exchanged electronic uh, information and facilitate electronic transactions as a whole. Because as I said before, there are, many businesses are still very reluctant because they just don't trust in um, that, that the information is not altered subsequently. They are worried that the court might not accept it. And um, so therefore, the electronic transaction that tries to lift this worries to a degree. So um, other laws you have also to take into consideration, especially when it comes to commercial registrations and so forth. And um, but the ETA is relevant for the for the electronic transactions as a whole. And as I said, in Thailand, many companies are still very reluctant because there were a, there were a bunch of concerns, and um, and and some of them were. Uh, the ETA try to address. So um, let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So for instance, yes, um, the, the many companies worried that if they send um, electronic documents that this will not be accepted at all. So the Electronic Transactions Act actually states now that if you have a requirement to send something in writing, um, this in writing has to be read as including electronic means. So for example, if you exchange something by email, this is valid. If you use text message, this is valid. So um, in writing, you have to keep in mind, always read it as including electronic means most of the times. Um, another big issue here were um, automated electronic systems for data exchange, actually. So there was a question, or it's an ongoing question, whether or not um, a contract can only be formed uh, if a human interaction is taking place there. What if a computer is talking to a computer, basically? So there was some uh, legal uncertainty around this. And now the Electronic Transactions Act states that um, a contract formed by automatic electronic systems for data exchange is still a valid contract. So um, that was actually quite relevant. Um, let's talk a little bit about electronic signatures. Yes, still this slide. Sorry, using two monitors here. <laughs> and um, Electronic signatures, yeah. The definition is actually very similar to what my colleagues have said before. And um, so electronic signature can be can can appear in various forms. And um, the law for itself does not prescribe how you how you have to do your electronic signature. It only states basically 
that the method that you use must allow identification of the signatory and the um, and the signature must indicate that the signatory approves of the above content, obviously. And, and then the law furthermore states that the method used must be reliable and appropriate with regards to the surrounding circumstances. And um, okay, it's useful that it does not prescribe a certain system. On the other hand, this leads to this, um, yeah, leads to the reluct reluctance in using electronic signature. But are still worried that a court might later on find that the specific case um, and the method used that do not match, right? So that the that the method was not reliable, that it was not appropriate with regard to the specific contract. So um, this is why it still is quite difficult in Thailand after all. Um, from our point of view, you can use digital signatures, for instance, in HR related matters, like let's say employment agreements and so forth, that can be quite useful. Um, you can also use it in commercial contracts in theory, but we think that in practice, a good chunk of companies will just not accept it. So, um, so you might send an electronic version of your document, but many companies will still ask you to, to send a properly signed with a wet, properly, with a wet signature signed contract and, and so forth, even asking for witnesses to um, witness the signature actually. So I think um, this is still a, this is still an ongoing ongoing thing, and um, this is. The, but the main takeaway is it is permitted, but not just not very used in, in practice, especially not in the B two B area. Um, can we go to the next slide here? Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, this is one more point. That was actually a big discussion. What if I have an online shop in Thailand? How do I form my contract? Many companies were quite reluctant, but then this, uh, the, the act has clarified that um, the actually the buyer makes the offer and the vendor actually accepts this offer. And this is how you form a contract on, an, on, on a platform like Lazada and not the other way around. Many companies were worried that they might face liabilities in this regard. So, um, yeah, to summarize this a little bit. Um, yes, you can contract digitally in Thailand, uh, adhering to the legal requirements, which are similar to what my colleagues have stated before. Um, however, as, as I said before, we see quite a, quite a divide between, um, between modern companies and startups using, uh, providing businesses, goods and services via apps and so forth. There it is very common to use um, digital contracting. Meanwhile, on the other hand, a vast majority of companies are still relying on wet signatures, wet signatures, and especially I would say if um, you have a little bit more of uh, experienced generation, let's say, that are uh, leading these companies, they are on average quite reluctant to use uh, digital signatures. Um, yeah, let me briefly address some of the developments in light of COVID-19 crisis now. As I said, we also adhere here to the principle of social distancing and um, Thailand has closed down its borders for lots of foreigners and uh, the government had to react in a way to these new uh, developments. So one relevant change was actually for board of director meetings and shareholder meetings that now can be held uh, electronically. This was possible in theory in the past already However, <laughs> the law required that all participants in such a meeting would have to be physically in Thailand. So you can have an electronic meeting provided that you are in Thailand. So especially for international companies, that was a little bit complicated to deal with. And now they even closed down the borders. So government has reacted and um, actually changed this regulation and said, okay, we can have uh, board meetings, we can have shareholder meetings with attendees being all over the place, um, all over the world, provided that you uh, comply with the normal requirements, such, a, um, such as uh, keeping records of the meetings and so forth. Um, so that was quite a notable change. Then we have seen some uh, government entities, especially the Board of Investment here in Thailand, um, changing their requirements to file documents, now strictly uh, electronically, and um, also facilitating interviews by offering Skype interviews or 
or similar. In the past, you actually had to go there physically. They closed down the um, offices, so it wasn't possible anymore. So we are thinking that this will be a this this trend will continue in the future, even after COVID-19. Um, yeah, on another note, the implementation of the Personal Data Protection Act in Thailand, which would have put quite some compliance requirements on companies, um, has been postponed for one additional year for most businesses, also to just um, lift a little bit of burden here. So that was also quite useful. Um, yeah, overall, we are thinking that uh, digital contracting will accelerate in the future. Many companies are now making their uh, experiences with home office, so um, there's no person to sign contracts and agreements. So we are thinking that this will um, restart a little bit um, the process of implementing some more digital and more IT measures to facilitate business in Thailand. And um, so we are thinking that over the next decade, um, we might see notable change here in Thailand for digital contracting. Okay, um, can we go to my next slide? Um, yeah, uh, claims management. This is also an important subject right now in Thailand. Um, oh, I think I'm running already out of time seeing Marcus there. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe then really briefly here. Um, Many companies in Thailand are facing cash flow issues right now, and they're trying to push payment obligation as much as possible. So from a practical point of view, uh, in Thailand, you should be prepared right now to, um, to negotiate with your, with your customers quite a bit. And um, we haven't seen any major shifts in the legal landscape so far. Um, there have been some, some shifts a little bit, and some, yeah, some things might get easier in the future, but it's still, way down the road. Um, however, um, we see a lot of clients having issues with a good internal claims management system in Thailand, and uh, especially when it comes to filing of documents and storing ongoing communications. So I think this is something where companies in Thailand should, should, take, a, should, take, a, should take a close look how they can optimize this right now, especially, so invoicing goes quite well usually, but the reminder and follow-up process um, not so good right now. So um, there should be a clear process in place and a clear responsibility to make sure that you, um, yeah, that you keep track of your outstanding receivables. So um, that is quite important for the time being. Um, let's briefly touch on, on uh, court and out of court formal dispute settlement. Um, so for litigation in Thailand right now, actually the courts have been closed. Uh, under under um, under regulation that passed in March, and they are still closed until end of um, end of May, as far as I know. So hearings and so forth have been postponed for the time being. And um, so if you are uh, considering enforcing your claim in court, th there will be delays for the time being. So um, you should keep that in mind. Um, exactly, and for. Yeah, for arbitration, we also have this here in Thailand, obviously. Thailand is a member of the New York Convention. Thailand is not a hotspot for arbitration, not at all. There have been lots of practical issues here. However, especially when it comes to visa and work permits of foreign representative or foreign, um, foreign arbitrators. However, what we're seeing right now, and that's quite interesting, that the Thai Arbitration Institute and the uh, Thai Arbitration Center are improving their systems to have um, online hearings and to digitalize the process overall um, remains to be seen how this plays out in the long run. But I think that is a that is a good overall uh, trend, and uh, we hope we, we certainly hope that this will continue in the future and make uh, dispute settlement and claims management in Thailand a little bit easier. And uh, yeah, so that's for me for claims management in light of the um, ticking clock. It is ticking, yeah, yeah, and we try to keep within the uh, time schedule at least a little bit, now, which of course when five lawyers talk is not a matter of fact. But yeah, um, these uh, efficiency in proceedings uh, and the more digital approach in arbitration and litigation might be a development which is indeed accelerated in various jurisdictions and uh, it's... Uh, Good that you highlighted this. Uh, let's see how it will develop in Thailand. 
at least one question uh, I will give from the Q&A. Um, here's one regarding the digital contracting. Um, can companies invoice electronically in Thailand? Um, yeah, you can invoice uh, it electronically in Thailand. However, for so if you send an invoice by email, then usually this is considered a payment reminder. If you're talking about tax invoices and tax e-receipt, you have to comply with uh, with a certain with a certain process that's um, been, been regulated under the by the revenue department. Depends a little bit on the size of your company. Uh, the, the threshold is accessible income of 30 million baht, I think. And above the, above this threshold, you have to you have to implement a certain software um, to send out tax invoices and uh, tax receipts. And I hear that implementing the software is in practice not so easy. And um, so there are some uh, service providers and companies that are that are, that can help you with that. Um, six or so listed by the revenue department, uh, but you have to have to use their system and have to implement it in your existing IT to a degree, which can be tricky. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Martin, for these Thailand aspects. And now we shift to our uh, last speaker of today, which is my colleague. Stefan Evers in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Stefan, how does this uh, digital contracting issue work in your jurisdiction? Yes, thanks very much, Marcus. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I think it's evening in some parts of the world already. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking part. I'll be rabbiting through the um, Vietnam presentation. I have prepared two slides, one for uh, digital contracting and one for claims management in Vietnam. Um, Maybe we can start with the first slide. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Bettina. Um, yes, you see there that, uh, that that the focus will not so much be on the digital part of, of contracting, because the digital part of contracting is not very much developed in Vietnam. We have passed a uh, resolution in 2018, that, which is the law on e-transactions, but the law on e-transactions has not been implemented so far. It is not yet in force. Hence, digital contracting itself in the way that we have heard about in the other countries here in the region is not in force, cannot be implemented. That's why I just lose a couple of words in relation to document and its execution of contracts itself and how to potentially do it remotely. In Vietnam, uh, we have two components in a contract. One is the signature, one is the stamp, the original stamp of a company. You as a local investor you or your, your counterpart your customer as a local investor has a uh, has a local stamp stamp of the company and the stamp needs to be attached to every single transactional document meaning particularly contract purchase orders etc so this already makes it very difficult for companies to um, perform digital uh, contracting hence the stamp um, uh, basically is the limitation in digital contracting Signatures, uh, signatures are in general required in original. Signatures have to be, if possible, in blue ink. And um, if you are the legal representative of a company, the legal representative is the individual that represents the company to third parties in Vietnam. Um, if you are the legal representative, then you can register what we call a stamp signature. This stamp signature is basically an actual stamp that can replace the signature. If you're not in the country, then this stamp can be used. And if it is properly registered with the authorities, with the police, as well as with the DPI, the Department of Planning and Investment, uh, then this stamp makes the document valid, replaces the uh, actual original signature. Authorized personnel um, that is acting on behalf of the legal representative cannot register a stamp of signature, hence, these individuals, these people have to sign in original. Therefore, very, very briefly, digital contracting in Vietnam is at this point of time not possible. Contracting itself needs to be done in original. The uh, original stamp needs to be attached to every document. What is possible in, in the digital way in Vietnam is e-invoicing. We just heard it from Thailand. E-invoicing is possible in Vietnam as well. We have this VAT invoice, this red invoice, how we call it in Vietnam or in China, it's called Pap Yao. Um, these invoices can be issued digitally, but that is not a contract. That is a statement that is an e-invoice and we re require an uh, actual e-invoice software registered with the authority, registered with the state government 
and uh, then you can invoice in a digital way. Um, that's it for uh, the digital contracting, which was not a lot, to be quite honest, in Vietnam. We can move on to the next slide, Bettina, thank you very much. Claims management in Vietnam. I see two components in claims management. One is, one is a proactive component, one is a reactive component. How can I, in a proactive component, pro prevent that a claim actually becomes default? Huh? We have general tools available in Vietnam to avoid defaults, and that can be letters of credit that are very efficient, as well as escrow accounts. Escrow accounts can be implemented with any um, uh, with with any commercial bank here in Vietnam. Um, the escrow account setup takes uh, quite a long time, so um, it, it, it's not suitable for every single transaction. That's why a letter of credit should be considered for most transactions to proactively uh, to 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 proactively avoid defaults in the accounts receivable. The commonly accepted in Vietnam as well, and that is very important to understand, commonly accepted in Vietnam are also deposits at different levels depending on the industry, means deposits or upfront payments. I've had a client which I was very surprised about that uh, he actually agreed with one of his local customers, a German client investing in Vietnam, selling um, selling products to Vietnam. The local customer agreed on a 100% upfront payment because of their long-standing relationship. Claims management is often also and mainly here obviously related to reactive uh, component tools available to collect defaults are particularly arbitration, bankruptcy procedures, labor claims um, have to follow a certain reactive uh, um, um, claim procedure as well as IP claims. Arbitration in Vietnam is a very, very transparent procedure. Um, normal courts in Vietnam are intransparent, should be avoided, and every single commercial contract can be agreed with VIAC. Vietnamese International Arbitration Center is the um, institution of choice and needs to be implemented properly in every commercial contract. Um, normal courts should be avoided by all means. They take time, they're expensive, and they are not 100% transparent. This is widely known. That's why the arbitration procedure has been implemented in the Vietnamese system and is very, very transparent. Um, you can, of course, also agree on foreign arbitration. Foreign arbitration, often Singapore, Paul, you mentioned it. Singapore is often used as, a, as an arbitration hub. Vietnam is part of the New York Convention, hence such arbitration award arbitration award can be enforced in vietnam as well following a certain procedure not very complicated very straightforward um, and also quite transparent bankruptcy procedures and insolvency procedures uh, you can claim as part of your bankruptcy uh, as part of your customers of your defaulting parties uh, component uh, you can you can claim as part of the bankruptcy and insolvency procedure mm. You need to um, you need to uh, register with the bankruptcy list and solvency list, and then you can claim the defaulting value. Labor claims have to follow a certain um, a certain procedure. You, as a company, as a foreign investor, will quite likely not claim labor-related claims, but your employees might follow these claims, and they can submit to any kind of um, labor authority with different labor authorities here, and all of them can assist the employee with the enforcement of their employee claim ip claims ip claims from overseas if you have a certain ip intellectual property um registered also for vietnam then you can follow and 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 your and, and a party or a company or any individual in vietnam is actually um uh, using your registered ip um without being being allowed then um, be, without being licensed then you can claim this at the IP authorities. Um, that's it very briefly rabbited through. I think we are at 4:33 Vietnam time, three minutes over. Um, I'm open for questions if there is any. Thank you very much for speeding this up and uh, allowing us to more or less stay within the time. Great. Um, also, of course, thank you particularly for these insights to the claim management aspects, which are also part of our session today. Um, as we see, um, digital contracting is still, uh, and the acknowledgement of it is still in a very different state in all these jurisdictions. And uh, we are eager to see how this will develop in the midterm future. At least we have 
time left for one question, which also refers to the play management issues that you just uh, talked about. Um, is there a debt collection system available in Vietnam that involves the sale of claims against the debtor? That is a that is a very good question. We know these kind of systems from um, particularly Western countries. I'm not sure if we have these kind of systems implemented in the region um, beyond Vietnam. I know there is there's some countries that have implemented it. Um, trading of claims is in general possible, but um, enforcing and 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 um, enforcing another individual's claim and uh, enforcing another owner's claim is only allowed when you're put uh, when you're licensed for this and there is exactly one state-owned company that is allowed to perform these kind of claim enforcements on behalf of another um of another uh, claim holder and um I'm, i i don't really remember the exact name of the company so it is in general possible but it's a monopoly in vietnam and um so you are subject to not very long lasting negotiations there when you want to sell your claim so uh it is possible in general but uh not very efficient because there's only one uh company that can do this that can perform these kind of things all right thanks uh let's leave it with this all other questions will as already uh, indicated be uh responded to later on um so thanks a lot to all you participants for joining in the session and of course to all speakers uh, who gave us uh, this interesting insight today and i would now like to give it back to bettina for the closing remarks thanks from my side Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, my colleagues and all the participants for joining and participating in this uh, webinar. Please accept my sincere apologies for some technical issues that appeared during the webinar. Um, I'm happy we could settle all of these and I hope you were nonetheless able to follow the explanations of my colleagues. Uh, like Marcus stated, please feel free to submit your questions. Um, just drop me an email and I will liaise with the colleague in charge. Um, I will have to check if the technical issues which were due to some connectivity problems on my side uh, affected uh, the, uh, the recording of the webinar, but in any case, uh, please feel free to drop me an email if you would like to have a copy of the slides. I will be happy to share these. So I hope you took some helpful insights with you today and we would be happy to uh, have you join us uh, on the next occasion in another webinar. Uh, Take care, stay safe, and have all a great day. Bye.